Um, so for those who are already joined, I do want to make a couple quick announcements for everybody. Um, so uh, we will be taking questions throughout all the talks, and uh, there's a couple different ways to submit your questions. One, you can hit the raise hand icon, and that will allow us to unmute you so you can ask your question verbally. If you prefer, you can also write it in. Uh, in addition to the chat, there's actually a Q&A feature, which we encourage you to use because it keeps your question organized, make sure it doesn't get lost in the chat. Um, if you do want to send something to everyone, the panelists and attendees, feel free to use the chat and just note that the default is that it only goes to the panelists. So if you want your other attendees to view it, you have to toggle that and change it to panelists and attendees. Uh, I'm also going to share in the chat with everyone now the links to all of the uh, the links to all of the uh, lunch room meetings. So in addition to this, we're doing lunch with astronomer at noon. And those are three separate breakout rooms that each have their own link so that you can go in and out of the rooms as you please. Uh, and so I emailed those to everyone this morning, but just so that we have them in the <coughs> chat here, I've just sent them in our chat. So we have dark matter, dark energy, and exoplanets. And I encourage you to hold on to those links for when we get to 12 o'clock so you can go in and out of the different lunch with astronomer rooms as you choose. Uh, with that, David, I think we're at 10.05, so if you want to go ahead and get started with our opening remarks, I think we have a, a good number of people already joined, and so we can let folks continue to filter in as you, as you get started. Great, thanks. Well, um, welcome to uh, all of you who are uh, returners to uh, FOSA, Friends of Ohio State Astronomy and Astrophysics, and to, uh, to any newcomers. Um, for those who don't know, FOSI is a, a joint effort of the Department of Astronomy and the Center for Cosmology and Astroparticle Physics, or CCAP, uh, both at Ohio State. Um, and our goal is to bring astronomy discoveries, uh, and especially astronomy discoveries coming from, from Ohio State, to the public. So to connect you to us. Um, and you know, all of us are very grateful to work in a field that's so interesting that other people want to find out about it just for fun uh, and for their own intellectual excitement. So we enjoy the, the opportunity to, to bring it to you. Um, FOSA started four years ago and sponsors a variety of events, um, including public lectures and planetarium shows. Um, this is the ninth of our big sort of biannual events. We usually have one in October and one in May. Um, and so in October, uh, we got to walk among the newly installed planets of our scale model solar system along Woodruff Avenue. It's a gift of Andy and Sandy Ross to Ohio State. Um, and unfortunately, uh, today, you know, the best we can do is, is choose fancy Zoom backgrounds. Um, and uh, all of us at, uh, at the university and elsewhere have been on a sort of crash course in online teaching and learning over the past two months. Um, so we have uh, tried to envision what we can do for FOSA as an online event, um, and we're grateful to, to all of you for tuning in, um, and to Anna Volker uh, and others for organizing uh, and participating in this event. I'll come back to that at the end, but for the remainder of my 10 minutes, I want to uh, brag about some of Ohio State's uh, astronomy's accomplishments. From, uh, from the last year. And I'll start with uh, prizes to our faculty. So most recently, uh, Todd Thompson, who uh, many of you have heard speak at, at previous FOSA events, um, won the Ohio State University Distinguished Scholar Award. Uh, and this recognizes his uh, fantastically innovative and wide ranging research on galactic winds, on black holes. Um, one of the highlights from his past year is using data from uh, from sky surveys to make the first discovery of a, a silent black hole, one that's not emitting x-rays because of gas that's falling on it, but one that is just sitting there and orbiting around another star. Um, and uh, Todd was able to, to discover uh, the influence of that black hole on its companion star and open up a whole new route to understanding the population of black holes in our galaxy. So this Distinguished Scholar Award is given to six of Ohio State's 3,000 faculty each year. So that's 0.2%. Um, so over a decade, about 2% of Ohio State faculty uh, win the uh, Distinguished Scholar Award. So this is a bigger uh, achievement. Um, and five astronomy faculty have won it in the past decade. So we're 
were overrepresented by a factor of 15. Um, and we're very proud of that. Uh, Chris Kachanik, uh, who gave uh, one of the first FOSA public lectures back in, in 2016, uh, this year won the Danny Heinemann Prize, which is the most prestigious of the, the mid-career prizes from the Ast American Astronomical Society. Um, and, uh, and like Todd, uh, Chris is, is distinguished by the, the breadth of his research. Um, that announcement came out in, in December, and then three weeks later, we learned that, that Chris uh, Kachanik had won another uh, American Astronomical Society Prize, this one together with Professor Professor Chris Stanek. Um, and as those of you who heard uh, Professor Stanek's public lecture back in February know, um, uh, Kachanik and Stanek are, are the leaders of the All Sky Automated Survey for Supernovae, um, uh, affectionately known as Assassin, uh, which monitors the entire visible sky every night. Um, this is actually the first time in human history that there is an, a nightly record of the entire visible sky. Um, and that nightly record has discovered an, an extraordinary range of phenomena, rare explosions, remarkable stars, stars being shredded by black holes. Um, so many OSU astronomers are involved in this, um, but Stanek and Kachanik lead the program. Uh, and for that, they were awarded the Beatrice Tinsley Prize, uh, which is awarded every, years to, every two years to recognize research of an exceptionally innovative or creative character. Um, and then John Beacom, who will be uh, speaking next, is the director of, of CTAP. Um, he leads our postdoctoral program uh, and is very dedicated to the success of our, our CTAP postdocs. Um, John won the 2019 Faculty Mentor of the Year Award from Ohio State's Office of Postdoctoral Affairs. Uh, he was nominated by a group of 15 current and former postdocs and students. And independently, he was nominated by a group of four faculty. Um, and uh, for winning that award, he was then nominated for the National Postdoctoral Association's Mentor Award, uh, which he won in January 2020. So this is awarded across all fields to a single faculty member uh, in the US who is engaged in except exceptional mentoring of postdoctoral scholars. So it's a great uh, feather in the cap for, for John and for CCAP for him to, to win that award. Um, turning to those postdocs, uh, we're pleased that uh, of our current uh, postdocs, Danielle Berg um, is just uh, about to start a faculty position at the University of Texas. Um, Heidi Wu, who you will hear from uh, later this morning, is about to start a faculty position uh, at, uh, at Boise State in Idaho. Um, and some of our other uh, recent postdoctoral alumni, uh, Tim Linden, who I think has given a, a CCAP talk, uh, sorry, a, a FOSA talk. Uh, is about to start a faculty position in Stockholm, um, Katie O'Kettle, uh, starting one in, in University of Melbourne. Uh, Michael Troxell is now in a faculty position at Duke University. Um, so lots of our, our postdocs and graduate students are going on to uh, other parts of astronomy. Um, many others are going into the, the data industry um, and the uh, astronomy has long been one of the, the drivers of, of big data um, and people who learn astronomy uh, are, uh, are also finding themselves uh, wanted in many other areas. And in fact, I was pleased to see on our participant list, my own first PhD student, BJ Narayanan, who is now the, the head of uh, machine learning for Microsoft. Um, so uh, it's interesting to see you know, how astronomy then spreads out into the, the wider world. Um, we have two PhD students graduating this summer. Uh, Jenna Freudenberg is going to become a postdoc at the University of Toronto, and Suk Sien Thi, uh, who will be uh, joining in a later event, um, is at uh, UC San going to UC Santa Barbara. Um, for our graduate program, this was the first year we've had equal numbers of women and men in our graduate program, um, and that's an important milestone for us. Uh, we had our first uh, all-female uh, incoming class that is now finishing its first year. And our incoming class for next year is going to be the, the second largest uh, incoming graduate class in Ohio State's history. So, um, so we still have lots of people wanting to, to come here and, and become astronomers. Um, and then two weeks ago, uh, we held a sort of online graduation event for our largest ever graduating class of undergraduate majors, 26 of them. Um, and our incoming ma major class will be the largest one 
uh, that we've ever had. Um, so this growth of our undergraduate program is also very gratifying. Um, it's also lots of work. Uh, we're very uh, grateful to David Zach, who's joined us as an, an undergraduate advisor this year and, and made a big difference there. Um, finally, uh, we've had uh, lots of action on the outreach front in the last year, um, including uh, public lectures on the Nobel Prize, on uh, Assassin, on gamma ray bursts. Uh, there'll be an upcoming online lecture on black hole imaging by Sarah Markov. Um, many of you uh, got to know Paul Sutter during his years here. Uh, Paul has now moved to New York City and become a full-time science communicator. His second book is coming out soon. Uh, I encourage you to uh, follow him and support him if you're able to. Um, and with Paul's departure, uh, we were very pleased to hire uh, Anna Volker who is an OSU alumna, won the 2018 $100,000 President's Prize for her uh, Sci Access project. Um, and so she rejoined us in January and is now our, our outreach coordinator and also uh, supports our undergraduate program. Um, she's been a, a whirlwind of activity, including the, the Making Space for All uh, webinar series that you've received announcements about and, uh, and organizing this. Um, and when we are all back to being outside, uh, she's going to organize a solar system run where we will uh, run through all the planets along Woodruff Avenue. So um, all sorts of, uh, of great things ahead. And uh, thanks all of you for joining us and enjoy the day. Thank you so much, David. I really appreciate that. And thank you to all of our attendees for joining us today. I'm so excited for the program we have before us. Uh, and I'm just going to give you a quick overview of what to expect, and then we'll get right into it. Um, so we're going to start off here with a series of science talks, followed by Lunch with an Astronomer. And the links to that are in the sidebar chat. Uh, if you joined uh, just recently, I mentioned at the beginning that if you have any questions throughout, please submit them using the Q&A function, uh, and that allows us to keep track of your questions. If you prefer to do it verbally, you can raise your hand, a little raise hand icon, and I can unmute you so you can ask your questions that way. After the lunch with an astronomer session at noon, we'll end the day with the Black Hole Apocalypse panel, which will be a panel of some of our expert astronomers who specialize in black hole research, and they'll be there to answer your questions about all the mysteries around black holes and specifically talking about some of the, the points discussed in the Black Hole Apocalypse documentary. I also wanted to share uh, that for those of you who haven't been able to join our Making Space programs as of yet, we do have them running all the way through the end of June. And I am just dropping in now a link for you guys in the chat. Uh, next week, we have an expert on CubeSats. Uh, and the episode is called The Electronic Bread Loaves of Space. And the week after that, we have the leader of NASA's effort to grow food in outer space. She's the lead project scientist for growing food on the space station and eventually Mars. All that's leading up to a June 29th event, which will be dedicated to disability inclusion in science and STEM. And that's uh, called Sci Access, and you can register for that here. As always, all of our events are free and just here to, to connect you guys and learn more about astronomy. So with that, Without further ado, I'd like to start off with our first speaker of the day, Professor John Beacom. All right, let's see if that works. Good morning, is that good? So it has long been imagined that the universe is full of invisible spirits. And we're gonna come back at the end to this historic view on the left and this contemporary view on the right. So if I don't get back to this at the end, please ask a question. But let's go right to my title. So the title is Neutrino Astronomy Made Easy. Let's go over what that means. If you don't know about neutrinos, this title is probably confusing. If you do know about neutrinos, this title is definitely confusing. And by the end of this talk, maybe it'll make sense. So let's start with what's astronomy. Everybody knows what that is. That's why you're here. You know it's... Uh, the study of space and all of its contents and not astrology. But let's go on to neutrinos. What's a neutrino? So imagine an electron. Everybody's familiar with that. Like if you take a balloon and rub it on your head and stick it to the wall, static electricity due to the movement of electrons. If you take an electron and you remove its electric charge and you remove almost all of its interactions and you remove almost all of its mass, 
then that husk that you're left with is a neutrino. And so that sounds like it, it barely interacts, and it does. It sounds impossible to detect. And astronomy is about detecting things. And neutrinos are about not being detected. So this title doesn't really make any sense. And it gets worse when I say I'm going to make it all easy. So let's see how I do. But what is a neutrino? Let's go back to the beginning on this. Uh, originally, there was a process observed. I'm going to simplify it a little bit where a neutron decays into a proton and an electron. That conserves electric charge because a neutron is neutral, proton is positive, and an electron is negative. That's all good. But this is what it looks like. Here's the neutron just sitting there minding its own business. This is where it was. And then out goes the proton and out goes the electron, and they go out to one side only. So if you took a, a round water balloon and you dropped it on the floor, you expect to get a circle on the floor. If you got a half circle on the floor, you would think something's weird. And that doesn't make any sense. And that's right. And that's because it didn't conserve energy and momentum. Initially, when the neutron is sitting there, there's no sideways momentum. And when you're done, all the particles, their momentum have to add to zero. So if some stuff goes this way, some other stuff has to go that way. And this was observed. And people said, well, that, that doesn't make any sense. So then a person hypothesized that maybe something invisible goes out the other way. And then you can balance energy and momentum. It's just, we can't see that thing. And the, the, the famous quote from this is, um, Pauli says, I've done a terrible thing. I've postulated a particle that can never be detected. So what he did is he just renamed the problem. The problem was conservation of energy and momentum. And he just renamed it neutrinos. He didn't actually solve anything. He just said, I'm giving a name to it and I'm tricking you into thinking that we know the solution. Just like we know the universe is full of dark energy and dark matter, but we don't really know what those things are. But we're really good at naming them and defining the kind of problem that they solve. So if you think about it, this is a perfect liar's license. If you have a problem you don't like, you can just blame it on neutrinos. And all these other unsolved problems, you can just blame them on neutrinos. Anything you can't solve in astrophysics, calculations don't work, you lost your homework, whatever, it's neutrinos. Nobody can ever catch you for blaming the problem on neutrinos. So that seems pretty good. And, and for people like me who are theorists, um, this, is, this is a total license. We can do anything now. And we just say it's neutrinos and nobody will ever find out. So all of our theories are uh, by definition correct. That sounds pretty good. But this field also has experimentalists who like to measure things and check things and be sure that they're real. And in 19, <clears throat> sorry, we'll get there. This is the reaction that we just talked about, a neutron decay to a proton, an electron, and a neutrino. Now, all of these neutrinos have funny little subscripts and bars and things. Doesn't really matter for today. Let's just call them neutrinos. This reaction happens. It was also observed that this reaction happens that a proton and an electron can combine and remake a neutron, but out goes a neutrino as well. Has to be. So if these two happen, then this one has to happen too. That means a neutrino can find a proton and make an anti-electron or positron, positively charged particle, and a neutron. So if any one of these reactions happens, the other two have to happen too. Basically, uh, if you can, you can take it apart, you can put it back together. So in, in, this was realized in 1934 by some theorists who said, well, technically, a neutrino would be detectable, but it's so incredibly hard that nobody will ever find us out in all of our uh, covering up the mistakes in our theories with just blaming it on neutrinos will never get caught because a neutrino can go through a light year of lead and nothing happens. So it's safe. It's good. But then along come the experimentalists. And first, they had this idea of using a nuclear reactor, because nuclear reactors produce, ideally, prodigious sources of neutrinos. And they found a friendly nuclear reactor operator who would let them work there, and they set up an experiment. And in 1956, they detected these neutrinos. So there's a whole bunch of interesting things here. It's a long story. Uh, this experiment here on the right, those are unshielded lead bricks. This uh, tank is normally filled with extremely toxic organic chemicals. Uh, there's nothing here that would pass an OSHA inspection today. 
confined space training, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but this is not actually the way they began. They originally began by saying, let's detect neutrinos by setting off a nuclear bomb. That seems easy and appropriate. And um, they got approval for that and they started constructing it. And nobody seemed worried about the fact we're just gonna set off a nuclear bomb just to try to detect neutrinos. Mm -hmm. The only reason they stopped is because they realized that based on some calculations, this reactor experiment was more likely to be successful. That was the only reason they didn't set off the bomb. So in 1956, once neutrinos were detected, all of us theorists were in trouble because that meant experimentalists could check our theories. And of course, that's the foundation of all of science is experimental verification of experimental tests of theories to figure out which ones are right and which ones are wrong. So what's interesting is the next day, basically, these two scientists at the top, Rhinus and Cowan, Basically, as soon as they had barely detected neutrinos, they said, oh, well, we can start doing astronomy with these now. So they set up this uh, experiment right next to a nuclear reactor in an incredibly dangerously close distance. And then immediately they thought, well, we could probably detect neutrinos from really distant stars and galaxies and start doing astronomy. So that seems outlandishly imaginative. And it was also right. It just took many, many decades for that to be true. So if we want to start using them as messengers, it was realized that basically everywhere in the universe, neutrinos are made, where it's, where it's hot and dense or wherever chemical elements are being transformed and so on, neutrinos are made. And the cool thing about neutrinos is, excuse me, the cool thing about neutrinos is that because they barely interact, you get to see the inside of a source instead of the outside of a source. And all kinds of other things that are cool about them that are better than optical astronomy. The only problem is it's super, super hard. But if we could make it work, this would reveal things that ordinary optical astronomy cannot. So how do you make a neutrino observatory? Well, you have an electron at rest, for example, and along comes a neutrino and hits it, and then boom, the electron moves. And when the electron moves, if it's uh, kicked hard enough, it'll make a little flash of light, and that can be detected. And you need a, a giant tank. So this tank on the left here is about the size of a large campus building. And it's filled with ultra pure water. And here's what it looks like. I don't know if you can see, there's um, three people in a boat um, way over there. And all of these things on the wall are, are photo tubes that are uh, about this big around. <clears throat> and those can detect those flashes of light. So what this detector is like, it's a very special place. It's a place where nothing ever happens. And the reason nothing ever happens is because it's deep, deep under a mountain and it's shielded from cosmic rays and it's cleaned of all radioactivities or nearly so, so that it's ultra, ultra pure. It's the cleanest water on earth. Uh, something like a million times cleaner than any water you've ever encountered. Mm. And so it has very low levels of radioactivity. And if it didn't have low levels of radioactivity, then occasionally things would happen like that decay I showed you back on the earliest pages when that decay happens, it kicks out an electron. Remember, we talked about that. And that can look like a signal. So they have to have things set up so that almost nothing is ever happening. And we're just waiting for one neutrino for no reason to move sideways. And if you saw that happen, if you're, you know, if you're in your kitchen and there's a book on the counter, and all of a sudden the book slides three feet to the right, obviously something weird happened. Nothing touched it. It didn't conserve energy and momentum, something happened and moved it. And that something must have been invisible. So obviously ghosts, uh, but you know, it could have been a really um, energetic neutrino, we'll see. So now I wanna talk about trying to do astronomy with these things for real. So let's go back to the sun and try to understand how it works. So why does the sun shine? And the, the first answer that everybody gives is actually a little too smart. Everybody says, oh, nuclear fusion reactions in the core. Well, slow down a little bit. The sun shines because it's hot. And all objects emit light, which might not be in the visible, but so for example, if you take a baked potato out of the oven, you don't see it glowing. Your oven's not that hot, but in, it's glowing in the infrared, which you can't see. And uh, all of us are glowing in, in wavelengths that we can't see, but can be measured with precise scientific instruments. So everything, 
that is above the temperature of absolute zero emits some kind of electromagnetic radiation just because its temperature is greater than zero. So everything shines because it's hot. Well, so then the real smart question is, what keeps it hot? So, you know, if you walk in the kitchen and there's nobody around and there's a, uh, a pan on the stove, you can't tell by looking at it typically if it's hot or not. And uh, it might be, might have been sitting there for hours, might be cool. It might have been under a hot flame before you came in the room and it might still be hot and cooling down. Or maybe it, the, the burner's still on, you just don't see it. So how do we figure that out? So what keeps these things hot? What would keep the sun hot for so long? So this pan on the right is obviously being kept hot. And if you turn off the burner, it'll still be hot five minutes later. Don't touch it. But what would keep it hot for a long time? An energy source. So in the case of the sun, what could that be? This is closely connected to how old is the sun. So, you know, the, the, the pan on the stove or whatever, you know, if you boil water on the stove and you come back five, 10 minutes later, the pan's still pretty warm. But how long could that last? And the sun seems to have lasted a long time, um, longer than me anyway. So it must be uh, really hot or something's keeping it hot. So the outside of the sun is about 5,000 degrees Celsius. It has tremendous energy, about 10 to the 26 watts, uh, much greater than a 100 watt light bulb. And the question is, what's keeping it hot? What's going on on the inside? And so different people have different theories. These are two black and white photos of some um, hipsters I took down on High Street yeah, with their, uh, their big beards and all of that. Probably some of you recognize these people. Uh, one of them is Darwin and the other one is Kelvin. And they had a debate and Kelvin said, the sun must be young in order that it could still be so bright. In other words, we're within, you know, the, the pan was boiling and we came in five minutes later, that's why it's still hot because we're pretty close to when it was super hot. Darwin said, no, no, something's gotta be keeping the sun hot because the earth is definitely old and therefore the sun is really old and therefore something's keeping it hot. And otherwise we wouldn't have enough time for the evolution of geologic features, the evolution of species, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So this is a big debate of the time um, and it was hard to resolve. And to recap it again, Kelvin thought sun is young, Darwin thought sun is old. How can we find out? Well, one way to find out is think about how we can measure ages of things we can't, that don't have a label on them. So probably many of you have had kids and if you have kids, you know that what they do is they bring their lunchbox home and they throw it in a closet and then eventually you discover the lunchbox and you're curious, how long has that lunchbox been in the back of this closet? I mean, it's still full of stuff. So if you're clever, you pack the lunchbox in a certain way. You maybe give a banana, who knows, some rice, some Twinkies, and, and just a, a piece of uranium just to keep it interesting. Now, the question is, you want to figure out, based on the remnants of these, how long the lunchbox has been sitting in the closet. So this is what it looked like before. Here's what it looks like afterwards. And your job is to look at the remains and figure out how long this has been sitting there. So, you know, if the banana still looks pretty decent, a couple of days, if the rice looks still semi-decent, just dried up, you know, could be months. Twinkies obviously takes a really long time to decay them. And the uranium that takes a, a couple of billion years. But by judging how um, decayed all of those things are, you can get a guess on how long the lunchbox has been there. And this is the idea behind carbon dating. Uranium and thorium dating is the same thing. It just allows us to probe much longer time scales. And this tells us that the earth and the sun both must be about 4.6 billion years old. So in other words, Darwin was right and Kelvin was wrong. That means something must be keeping the sun hot for a long, long time. It must have an energy source it can keep it hot for a really extended period. So what could that be? So we can do a little math here. Um, so the football team is comprised of players. And if you have a scale, you can measure the players one by one and get their masses. And if you have a giant scale, like at a truck stop or something like that, you can throw everybody on the scale and measure the mass of the whole team. 
And we know that the relationship between these two boxes should be an equal sign. Measure the players individually, throw them all on the scale at once. You add up the player masses, you should get the mass of the team. That makes perfect sense. But uh, that's maybe not the only way things could go. So what if you took the mass of a helium nucleus, which is two protons and two neutrons, and we compare it to the mass of two protons and two neutrons. We can measure proton masses, we can measure neutron masses, we can measure helium masses. So I want you to think a moment, what is the relationship that goes in the middle of these boxes? It could be equals, could be less than, could be greater than. And I want you to think a moment about the one physics equation that pretty much everybody on earth knows. And that equation is e equals mc squared, which tells us that mass is a form of energy. So I'm gonna tell you the answer to this and it's less than. So this is weird. It's like you, um, you know, made a cake. You measure the mass of the eggs, the milk, the flour, all of those things. You put it all together and when you were done, the cake weighed less than the, ingredient, than the sum of the masses of the ingredients. It doesn't make any sense. But it's true, and this is actually uh, something amazing, and it's equals mc squared that accounts for the lost mass. So what that means is, if you put two protons and two neutrons together, you get a helium nucleus, and you get some energy. Because some of the mass went away and was converted to energy, like kinetic energy, moving things around. And uh, in the, the, like about 1920, Arthur Eddington, said, uh, gee, I wonder if this equals mc squared thing has something to do with powering the sun. And I wonder if this, you know, helium being less than the mass of its parts uh, has something to do with powering the sun. And he was right. And so the prediction is you should be able to take four protons and put them together. And when you do that, you turn two of the protons into neutrons and out come two anti-electrons and two neutrinos. And then also that energy, the equals mc squared thing I mentioned. So that's a bold hypothesis. It says the sun is mostly protons and that occasionally you can put four protons together, get out a helium nucleus, some neutrinos and some energy. That's not so easy because protons hate each other. Protons are repelled from each other because they have the same charge. And so shoving four protons together can only happen if uh, the sun is extremely hot in the center such that all the protons are whizzing around like crazy and occasionally have a chance to get together even though they're repelled from each other. That would require an insanely high temperature for the core of the sun. And if that were true, then there should be high energy neutrinos leaving the core. Every time a nuclear fusion reaction happens, high energy neutrinos leave the core basically immediately because the neutrinos go freely through the sun. All of that kinetic energy they make and some gamma rays and some other stuff gradually comes out as optical photons on the surface, like 100,000 years later. So you heat, you do the nuclear reaction in the core, the neutrinos come out immediately, and that heat that you deposit in the core eventually comes out as uh, keeping the surface of the sun hot. So this is a crazy, crazy prediction, but it's testable, because if it's true, then this, we should be able to measure neutrinos from the sun. So this is an actual image of neutrinos from the sun. The um, little dot in the middle is, is the size of the sun. And this big blob is where the neutrinos are coming from. And the reason that the neutrino blob is bigger than the sun is not that the neutrinos are being made outside of the sun. It's just that our neutrino camera is very, very blurry. Really, all of these neutrinos are being made inside that dot. In fact, inside the centermost part of that dot. This is an incredible image taken with the Super Cameo Conde neutrino detector, <clears throat> showing that the sun is indeed producing neutrinos like crazy. A funny thing is, it's only producing about a third as many as expected. This is a story for another day about how neutrinos can change flavor from an easily detectable type, electron neutrinos, into a harder type to detect, muon and tau neutrinos. And that won a Nobel Prize in physics, but we'll save that for later. So our new understanding of the sun is it is powered by nuclear fusion reactions in the core. And we now know the temperature of the core and it's 15.7 million Kelvin or, or basically Celsius. And we know that to 1% precision. And we know that because we've measured the neutrino flux. So this is something we could not have done without measuring neutrinos. 
So to wrap up, my life's work is to make neutrino astronomy real, not just to measure the sun, but to measure, measure the sun better, to measure uh, neutrinos from exploding stars, to measure neutrinos from matter accreting on the black holes. There's a whole long technical study to make all of these things work and make neutrino astronomy as broad and as interesting as optical astronomy. Now, it's pretty obvious why I'm interested in this. It's the fun of being able to figure how to hard puzzle. And, you know, you can, uh, neutrinos allow us to see in things. So if I hear some noise in the wall, I might wonder, is it termites? Is it squirrels? Is the house just settling? If I had eyes where I could see through the wall, I would know. So neutrinos allow us to see into astrophysical objects, the insides of them, and figure out how they work. And this understanding helps us understand, this gives us an understanding of how the chemical elements were made. And those chemical elements are responsible for planets and life and us. But even if you don't care about those things, you think, ah, oh, that's too academic, doesn't matter. On a purely practical level, <clears throat> neutrinos allow us to make measurements that are impossible otherwise. And some of the most sensitive instruments ever built are built to measure neutrinos. So for example, this is a picture of a nuclear reactor. Nuclear reactors produce neutrinos like crazy. If you claim you have a nuclear reactor in that shed and you allow me to set up a neutrino detector outside, I can tell if the reactor is on or off and you can't lie to me about it. I can tell if the reactor is producing plutonium or not and you can't lie to me about it. So there are practical reasons that we would care about neutrinos. So let's come all the way back to the beginning in this image. The image on the right, like I said, is an image of the sun in neutrinos as measured by Super Camille Conde. The image on the left is imagined by Dante and drawn by Adore of the sun surrounded by a, a heavenly host of spirits. It's just sort of an interesting that uh, people's imagination actually came true in this case. So that's all, thanks. Thank you so much, John. That was fantastic. Uh, we have time for about one or two questions and then we'll move along. So if you have a question, please submit via the Q&A now. Uh, I also want to just read out one of the questions and answers that I enjoyed. Uh, one individual asked, can we attend multiple lunches? And David, if you don't mind me reading your answer, I think others will, will enjoy it. Uh, option one is to spawn two parallel universes in addition to this one and attend each lunch in a different universe. Option two, you can join with a different device and multitask. And if neither of those work for you, you can go in and out of the different lunch rooms. I also had one attendee point out there was a typo in one of the links. So I'm going to send that again. Our uh, dark matter lunch link was accidentally uh, repetitive of the dark energy one. Uh, they are different. So I'm now resending with the correct information. So please use that when you decide to join. Uh, so with that, uh, I have no open questions for John at the moment. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and move along to our next talk. But thank you so much, John, for teaching us all about the wonderful world of neutrinos. So next up, we have the interstellar medium and radio astronomy with PhD student Jai Sun. So take it away. Hey. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm going to share my screen right now. Uh, are you all able to see my screen? All right. Yes. Great. OK. So uh, I just uh, introduce myself uh, but real quick. So I'm a PhD candidate here at the Department of Astronomy, working with Professor Adam Leroy. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about the interstellar medium. And my subtitle is called Matter of Life and Death. So I'll, in a sec, I'll explain what the interstellar medium is and why I say this matter uh, is a matter of life and death. So first of all, uh, what is the interstellar medium? So simply put it, it is all the stuff that fills the vast space between the stars that we call the interstellar space. So this includes gas particles that are made of uh, elements that we're familiar with, including hydrogen, helium, and heavier elements. This also includes dust grains, uh, which are small particles, uh, carbonaceous particles, measured between a few molecules and up to maybe 0.1 um, uh, micrometer. And uh, this, although it's less uh, commonly mentioned, uh, the broader term of the interstellar medium also includes the magnetic field in it and also the radiation that's filling the space. So uh, some of you might just say, wait, I was told that the outer space is very empty. And you are totally right about that. The interstellar medium is extremely dilute. And to give you a sense, it is more so than any man-made vacuum chamber on Earth. So this is a very empty space. 
However, uh, I believe some of you might also heard that space is immense. And this means that the total mass actually adds up over the vast space. And if we add up all the mass in the interstellar medium, it actually accounts for a good fraction of the visible matter in the galaxy. For example, it counts about like 15% of the visible matter in our galaxy. And uh, just to clarify here that I mentioned visible matter because uh, I haven't included dark matter into the, uh, the account. So some more fun facts about the interstellar medium. Uh, the interstellar medium could be very cool or very hot, depending on where we look. So the temper temperature range is enormous. It ranges from uh, a million Kelvin, uh, which is much hotter than the surface of the sun, but maybe not as much, not as hot as the center of the sun, as just mentioned by um, John. Uh, and it can range down to even less than 10 Kelvin, which is just 10 degrees above absolute zero. And uh, this means that uh, the gas should also be in a wide array of different phases. Uh, including ionized phase, uh, atomic phase, and even molecular phase. Um, a second fact, which I think is the more important one, is that the interstellar medium is both the nurseries of young stars and the graveyards of dead stars. Um, so this is exactly why I use the subtitle matter of life and death, uh, because interstellar medium is matter in the interstellar space, and it matters for the life and death of stars and planets. So uh, to put it in a, another way, it gives birth to all stars and planets in our galaxy, and it retains a memory of all the stars ever seized. So hopefully, this gives you enough motivation uh, to think that interstellar medium is interesting. The next question will be, how do we observe the interstellar medium? Right? So actually, the answer to this question depends a little bit on where we want to look. So if we want to focus on the hotter part, of the interstellar medium, which is very likely hotter than the sun, the surface of the sun, uh, what we can do is that we can look at radiation in X-ray, in ultraviolet, and in visible light. So this image here uh, is showing the Triffid Nebula in visible light. So the reddish color in the right side part of this image actually uh, is the light emitted by the ionized hydrogen in this region. So there's a very massive star in the center of this region that's uh, ionizing all the gas around it. And whenever we see an image like this, we can say, aha, all the gas in this region are being ionized. Um, so we can actually get more information from this by taking a uh, spectro uh, spectroscopic measurement uh, to analyze the light in more detail. And that could give us very useful information like element abundance in these regions. Uh, on the other hand, if we are more interested in the cooler part of the interstellar medium, uh, we might want to use infrared, infrared light and radio wave uh, to detect things. Uh, so this we can no longer see with our eyes, but uh, um, like carefully designed telescopes can help us do this. So, so this picture uh, is a so-called, uh, the picture of a star forming complex uh, taken by the Herschel Space Telescope. We are actually looking at the far infrared emission from the dust particles in the interstellar medium. The interstellar medium in this region is cool enough and dense enough that it gives birth to young stars. And we call these kind of objects stellar nurseries. So my research focused on understanding this type of objects. My research is not so much about uh, taking a very detailed look at each, at any individual uh, stellar nursery, but my research is more about getting the demographic inf information for a large population of stellar nurseries. So to get a large population of stellar nurseries, uh, we can no longer restrict ourselves to, uh, to look at nurseries in our solar neighborhood like this one. Uh, we need to go beyond the solar neighborhood and even beyond our own galaxy because uh, there are just that uh, there are just a number, uh, well, there are just uh, a fair amount of them in our own galaxy. So we need, to, we need to go beyond our galaxy to build a larger sample. However, doing this is not so easy. Uh, if we look at a nearby galaxy like this, uh, in this image, all the blue blobs are the stellar nurseries uh, in this galaxy. And if we actually put the previous image into the right scale, you can see that the image is actually just as this large. So it is very small in nearby galaxies. And this means that if we want to detect them and create a large sample of them, we need very high resolving power and very high sensitivity for our telescope. So this hasn't been very possible uh, for a many long time, for, for, a, for a long time. 
but right now it becomes possible because the advent of powerful uh, telescopes. So here is an example. So this is a telescope called the Atacama Large Millimeter and Submillimeter Array. So it's actually an array of telescopes. So this telescope, uh, so this telescope array locates on the mountaintop in Chile. Uh, we chose that remote site for good reasons. Uh, first of all, we want the atmosphere above the telescope to be as thin as possible because we don't want a lot of stuff between the telescope and the object we want to see. And also we want to be away from human activity because human activity can create signal, uh, signals that um, potentially contaminate the signal we are looking at. So the combination of the good sight and the advancements in uh, technology uh, in the uh, detectors uh, means that we have right now an unprecedented sensitive and uh, high resolving power telescope. So with this telescope, we are, we are, uh, we are eventually able to create a large sample of stellar nurseries. We observe them and we measure their properties. Even with this telescope, actually mapping the stellar nurseries in many nearby galaxies still requires a fair amount of effort. So that's why we work in a large international collaboration. Uh, the name is the FANGS International Collaboration. And FANGS is actually an acronym standing for physics at high angular resolution in nearby galaxies. So here uh, I'm listing all the people in the collaboration and the, uh, the names in blue uh, are actually uh, all the people here from the OSU. So this includes my advisor, Adam Leroy. This also includes many of my um, colleagues, uh, Sarah Kessler, Amy Sarden, and uh, Diaz Utomo. Um, so with all the uh, excellent effort putting together by these people, we are finally able to build up a data set that, have, that we have dreamed of for years. So here are the images of 49 galaxies uh, illustrating the distribution of stellar nurseries in them. So don't, uh, so, so if you just focus on each individual panel, um, each of them is a map of a galaxy and actually each individual pixel in that map tells a story. It tells about uh, the distribution, distribution of stellar nurseries, sorry. It tells about the distribution of stellar nurseries at that location. So in total, uh, this is a huge data set, and in total, we have about 100,000 stellar nurseries across, across almost 100 individual galaxies. And this is orders of magnitude improvement in terms of uh, the data set size, but also a, lot, a huge improvement in terms of the sampling strategy, uh, because we are sampling uh, a more typical set of nearby galaxies in our local universe. So uh, from now on, I'm going to talk about what we have learned from this awesome data set. But before I do that, I want to first mention what we have already known about this standard nurseries. So here, I'm showing you three images of three different standard nurseries uh, in our neighborhood in the Milky Way. Um, so very, uh, many early studies uh, use uh, these kind of, uh, many early studies put together a sample of this type of standard nurseries and study their properties. One thing uh, they have concluded, which you might also be able to conclude uh, based on your, uh, based on just looking at the pictures, is that uh, the standard nurseries in our solar neighborhood look very similar to each other. Uh, that's not only in the sense of their visual appearance, but also in the sense that if you measure their physical properties, uh, for example, physical property A, B, C, uh, you notice that uh, th those A, B, and Cs follow a similar set of relationship between each other. So this is saying that uh, there must be some um, uniformity uh, that's existing in the stellar nurseries. So then people have inferred from this fact that uh, possibly those stellar nurseries are governed by a similar set of physical principles. They follow a similar evolutionary track and thus they end up look alike. A implication of this is that uh, each of those stellar nurseries must be an autonomous entity. So they do not care about what's going on around them in their ambient environment, but they just do their own thing. Now, with our data set, which cover a, which cover a huge number of uh, stellar nurseries in a very diverse uh, sample of environment, we are finally able to test this assumption. So here I'm showing you one galaxy coming from the FANGS uh, data set that I just mentioned before. Uh, on the right-hand side, uh, you are looking at the visible light image uh, which uh, is captured by the Hubble Space Telescope. And it tells you about basically the distribution of all the stars in the galaxy. 
uh, on the left hand side, you're looking at uh, the map that's generated by the ALMA array I just mentioned, the, the telescope array uh, in Chile. And uh, that's telling you about the distribution of all the stellar nurseries in these galaxies. So each individual blob here is representing an individual stellar nursery in the galaxy. So one, uh, one key message we have learned from this data set is that actually the stellar nurseries at the different location in the galaxy uh, look actually different. So if you look at the central blob here uh, in the center of the galaxy and compare it to another smaller blob uh, at the outskirts of the galaxy, you notice that they look quite different. Uh, the center blob seems to have a larger size and seems to be brighter. So that's telling you that the stellar nurseries near the central part of the galaxy is more massive uh, and of larger size. Uh, we can also uh, derive more information by taking a deeper look into our data. And what we measure is that uh, the density and uh, also how quickly gas particles move around within each set of nursery also depend on the location uh, of that standard nursery in the host galaxy. So this is telling us that instead, those standard nurseries apparent, apparently talk to their environment and find a way to adjust themselves to fit in to that environment. So uh, this is saying that when another sun is formed in a stellar nursery locating in another galaxy, we would expect the nursery to be behave differently because it's locating in a different galaxy at a different location. And therefore, we might also expect that uh, the formed sun is a little bit different from the sun of ourselves. So this actually is a very important message because it's linking uh, large scale to smaller scales. And it's linking the galaxy, the, the, the story of the galaxies to the stories of uh, the newly formed stars and potentially planetary systems around them. And uh, this picture contradicts previous understandings and it calls for a new picture uh, in which the stellar nurseries are more responsive to their environment. You might be wondering, um, how do those stellar nurseries know where they locate in that galaxy? So actually the reason is that there's a built-in self-regulatory mechanism that keeps them near, near a equilibrium state. So the mechanism is like this. Uh, standard nurseries give birth to stars. But what I didn't mention is that stars actually act, act badly on their natal nurseries. They tend to destroy the nurseries because uh, the radiation from the young stars is very intense. And after, quite, uh, after a small amount of time, there might be a supernova exploding uh, in that region that would destroy the entire nursery. So this is really bad for each individual nursery because uh, they won't have long lives. But for a big chunk of a galaxy, uh, like circled by this, uh, by this region, um, this makes an uh, effective negative feedback loop. Uh, negative feedback loop. And uh, the mechanism is like this. So whenever you have the star formation, the rate of star formation to go higher inside a region, uh, the disruptive effects of the young stars will destroy more nurseries in those regions. That will leave less nurseries in this region, and means, which means that uh, the star formation rate in the next uh, time step will be lower. So that's actually a negative feedback, and that keeps uh, the entire galaxy ecosystem near a st stable state. And because the location of that equilibrium rate uh, depends on the properties of that local environment, this also means that the stellar nurseries are forced to um, conform to that environment. So this is why uh, stellar nurseries actually cares about uh, what their environment is looking like. So to give you a summary, uh, with the awesome data set that we put together with the ALMA array, we are finally able to put the stellar nurseries in the context of their host galaxies. Uh, so I've mentioned that the stellar nurseries are where the stars and planets are born. Uh, and they are put it into the context of their host galaxy and their host galaxy actually evolve with time. Uh, and by identifying the mechanism that link the stellar nurseries to their host galaxies, we are actually uh, add, adding fuels to a paradigm shift that's taking place in the field, uh, which is saying that stellar nurseries are no longer viewed as isolated autonomous objects, but they actually respond to their environment. And uh, we, are hope, we are hoping that together, all these observations will help us embrace a new united framework of star planet formation and evolutionary, uh, galaxy evolution together. So I think I'll stop here um, and uh, happy to take any questions.
Thank you so much, Jenny. We do have a couple questions for you, uh, including a couple hands raised. First, I'm going to unmute Terry, uh, who has her hand raised to ask a question. Uh, and so, Terry, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. You now have uh, talking permissions, uh, and feel free to ask your question. So Terry, you're still muted on our end, but you, if you unmute your mic on, on your side, you'll be able to, to ask verbally. Oh, okay. no, no question at this time. That was an accident. I apologize. Oh, okay, no worries. Well, we do have one other hand raised, uh, Haley, uh, Haley Thurston. So Haley, if you want to go ahead and unmute yourself uh, and uh, see if you have a question. Hello. Um, I, I was wondering, so is the, is the Hubble Space Telescope in space? Uh, yes. Uh, okay. basically, yes, it is in space. And that's why we can create okay. an image like that. Yes, and, and those images are, they're not really, I mean, I, I am totally blind, so they're not really displayed on my screen. Could you kind of describe them, what, what is going on there? Oh, uh, okay, like, like on this slide? Totally blind, I, I, I can't. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm happy to. I'm happy to describe it. So, <laughs> it's basically, yeah, it's a little bit hard to describe. But uh, if you like, I, I, I'm sure you have looked at uh, images of galaxies properly. And uh, I, so, I have. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So this one looks very similar to a uh, typical spiral galaxy uh, in which you have a large scale um, arm of stars. Uh, and you can identify them. And uh, based on that appearance, you will judge that that's a spiral galaxy. Uh, another uh, interesting fact is that this galaxy also holds a large scale structure in the disk called a stellar bar, uh, which is basically a elliptical shaped um, distribution of stars near the center of the galaxy. And I don't know if you can see the left side of this image, but you, if you can see um, all the white blobs there is tracing the location of that stellar bar. Okay. So just to add to that, Haley, um, so when he's talking about the stellar bar, it's a horizontal structure in the center of the galaxy. Uh, and so uh, on Jai's screen, there's sort of a, a split view of the galaxy. And on the right hand side, you have what would be captured by the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, and on the left, it looks sort of more of a, a blue tint. Uh, and in the center, uh, instead of being just a regular circle in the middle, it's a stretched out sort of horizontal um, uh, bar, as he called it, in the middle of this particular spiral galaxy. OK. Cool. Thank you so much. Uh, and so speaking of Hubble and space telescopes, we actually do have another question here um, about the, the new James Webb. David is wondering, uh, how will the new James Webb help with your future studies once it is active? Ah, the future Gem Gems Web. So, uh, yeah, just to mention that the, the future Gems Web telescope, that's, again, that's another space telescope, um, that will act, uh, that, will, uh, that will take awesome observations in the near infrared and mid infrared. So, for my observation, um, in, those two, uh, in those two bands, uh, what we will be able to observe are the uh, emission from the dust grains in the interstellar medium. And that's helpful because uh, the emission from those dust grains is actually uh, telling us about uh, how many dust grains are there at each location and how hot the dust grains uh, are. Uh, and uh, that's useful information because uh, how many of the dust grains is telling us the density of the gas to first order and how hot the dust particle is is telling us how intense the radiation field in that region is heating up the gas. So this simultaneously gives us information uh, a lot of information about both the interstellar medium and the star formation activity in that galaxy. And the fantastic sensitivity and resolution of uh, James Webb will um, clear up a lot of pictures, uh, a lot of the uncertainties right now in the picture. Great, thank you. We have another hand raised from Terry Gates. Uh, so Terry, I've just unmuted you, so you should feel free to ask your question. Uh, Terry, I'm gonna give you a couple more moments here to, to ask. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. All right. So in the in the left side of the picture you have on your screen now, you, you were saying that that's where we're seeing our stellar nurseries. 
what's driving, uh, I mean, so we, we can see the different intensities, the different colors. What does that represent? What are we seeing here? Oh, yeah, uh, awesome question. And I apologize that I haven't uh, said that clearly. So um, if we look at, for example, the white area, the white area is when all the colors saturate, and that's telling you that uh, the emission from the standard nursery is really strong in those regions. And then uh, like outside those white, whitish area, we look at like bluish area, uh, which is a little bit fainter than the whitish area. That's telling us that the stellar nurseries or the gas in the stellar nurseries in those regions are um, less dense and emit less light compared to the densest area. And then we have uh, the black area in which we don't have, we don't detect uh, much of the emission from um, the interstellar medium, which is telling us that probably there isn't much going on in those areas. So that's sort of uh, what this picture tells about. So okay, so it's an, in, it's an intensity that we then interpret as a measure of density. Yes, the, so basically you can interpret, interpret the in, intensity as a measure of um, surface density, which is basically how many, how, how, how much gas there is in a given area. So this is more like a um, surface area. Um, so, so it's basically the amount of gas divided by the area of that gas. Excellent, thank you. Thank you. So we are unfortunately out of time, uh, but uh, Jai, question for you. Will you be able to stay until the end of the, the morning science talks? Absolutely. Excellent. So if we have time after all the talks, we will circle back. I have about six more questions for you, but unfortunately we need to keep going along. Um, so uh, if we do have time after our final science talk this morning, we'll circle back to the pending questions, but we do want to continue on. So thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, and we're now going to switch over to Heidi Wu. So Heidi, feel free to take it away. Thank you, Anna. The universe is a big place and it is dark. And we have evidence that the universe is getting bigger and bigger in a rate that is faster and faster. And we think it is caused by dark energy. And in this talk, I will tell you how we study dark energy using galaxy clusters. About a about hundred years ago, astronomer Vesto Slifer found that almost all galaxies in the universe are moving away from us. And then Edwin Hubble found that farther away galaxies are moving away faster. And this is the property of an uniformly expanding universe. And the theory of an uniformly expanding universe was first developed by Alexander Freeman and George Lemaitre. And we can understand the expansion of the universe using an expanding balloon. As the balloon expands, the distances between galaxies get stretched. If two galaxies are farther apart, and the distances between them get increased faster, and then they appear that they are moving away faster. And I'd like to emphasize that galaxies themselves are not expanding. We know gravity pulls things together. So for many decades, astronomers thought that the expansion should be slowing down by the gravitational pull. About 20 years ago, uh, two teams of astronomers led by Sol Perimeter, Brian Schmidt, and Adam Rees used type 1a supernovae to determine the distances across cosmic time. Type 1a supernovae are exploding stars, and we can know their absolute luminosity very accurately. We call them standard candles. Imagine you have a box of candles. They all have the same luminosity. And you can put them at different distances. 
and the farther away candles will appear fainter. And by looking at the observed brightness of the candle or the supernovae, we can determine its distances very accurately. And surprisingly, they found that the expansion is accelerating. What does it mean that the, uh, the universe is accelerating? So if I throw an apple into the sky, it will fall back down to the earth. But what if I throw an apple in a velocity of 1,000 kilometers per second? I won't be able to demonstrate that, unfortunately, because of the virtual conference. But this velocity is fast enough for this apple to escape the local group. So let's follow the trajectory of this apple. It will leave the Earth and slow down by the gravity of the Earth. It will be slowed down by the gravity of the Milky Way, and it will further be slowed down by the gravity of the local supercluster. But after it leaves the local cluster, it will start to follow the acceleration of the universe, meaning that this apple will run away faster and faster. This is very counterintuitive. And we attribute this acceleration to dark energy. Before I talk more about dark energy, let me quick, quickly mention another dark component in our universe, dark matter. So in 1960s, astronomer Vera Rubin measured the velocity of stars in, in a galaxy. And what she found is that the, galaxy, the stars in galaxies are moving so fast that they cannot be possibly hold together by the visible matter. There must be some invisible matter that exists to pull these galaxies, sorry, to pull these stars so that they don't uh, run away from the galaxy. And we call this dark matter. By the way, I really like this picture of Vera Rubin because it shows that to study astronomy, we need not only telescopes, but also microscopes. So now we have evidence that our universe is dominated by dark energy, which is 68% of the total energy and matter density. So just a quick reminder that we know that E equals mc squared, so we can compare matter and energy together. And the second component, second largest component is dark matter, which is about 27% and it determines the structure formation and galaxy formation. Finally, less than 5% of the matter is in the form of ordinary matter or the ga gas and galaxies in the universe. And you might ask, why don't we ever feel the effect of dark energy and dark matter? This is because on the Earth, everything is in the form of ordinary matter or everything you can find, or all the elements you can find on the periodic table. Even in our Milky Way, dark energy is still negligible, and it is dominated by dark matter. And about 15% of the matter is in the form of ordinary matter. So this is why I say that galaxies themselves are not expanding, because it's basically uh, uh, it's basically dominated by the gravity of dark matter. So when we go to scales that's much bigger than the local group, then we start to see that dark energy dominates the energy budget in the universe. Dark matter and dark energies, dark energy sounds very similar, but they are very different. Dark matter is attractive and they determine the star formation, uh, sorry, structure formation. They are clumpy and they are made of particles we haven't detected yet. And they contribute to 27% of the total energy in the universe today. Dark energy, on the other hand, is repulsive. It is driving the acceleration of the universe. It is smooth and we don't have explanation for it yet. 
it, con it contributes to about 68% of our total energy. This talk is about galaxy clusters and why am I spending this time talking about dark energy and dark matter? This is because galaxy clusters formation is, is determined by both dark matter and dark energy. What are galaxy clusters? Here I'm showing a picture of uh, taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. So it basically have lots of uh, orange blobs and each of these blobs are um, each of these blobs is a galaxy and bigger than our Milky Way galaxy. And galaxy clusters are the highest density peaks or the large, largest found objects in the universe. And its mass is about 10 to 14 to 10 to 15, the 15 times the mass of the sun. And its size is a few million light years across. The mass of the sun is about 10 to the 13 kilograms, and one light year is 10 to the 16 meter. So, um, but our system is um, billions light years. You can see that the astronomy uh, units are pretty uh, inconvenient when we talk about cosmology. So how do these galaxy clusters form? Um, sorry. Uh, so galaxy clusters, actually is also dominated by dark matter. The picture taken by the Hubble Space Telescope is, is only shows about 2% of the total matter in a galaxy cluster. And about 10% of the mass is in the form of hot gas and, we, and they emit X-ray. We need to see them using X-ray telescopes. But about 88% of the ma mass is in the form of dark matter. We cannot see them, but we can infer them by looking at the gas, uh, looking at the galaxies, which I will talk about in a few slides. So how do galaxy clusters form? Here I'm going to show you a computer simulation simulating the formation of a galaxy cluster. We start with small density fluctuations in the universe, and you can see that small blobs of dark matter start to form. And these small blobs interact together and merge together to form bigger blobs. And you can see that there are these filament structures along which this small stuff falling in to form a bigger structure. And in the end, this forms a 10 to the 15 solar mass um, galaxy cluster. And what you see here is the dark matter component, which um, dominates the gravity and or provide a gravitational potential to form um, galaxies. I use lots of simulations like this to help me better understand the formation of galaxy clusters and to observe and to compare with observations. Dark energy plays a role in this formation of clusters, but they are not easily seen. So let me put, point that out. So I mentioned that in the formation of galaxy cluster, there's these filaments along which stuff falling in. And dark, en dark matter's gravity is pulling this stuff inward towards the gravitational potential. And at the same time, the dark energy is pushing stuff outside this gravitational potential. So it's the formation of a galaxy cluster is basically, basically a tug of war between dark matter and dark energy. So if I put in more dark energy into this simulation, the stuff will have difficulty falling into the galaxy cluster. So in the end, this galaxy cluster will become smaller. And also if this happens everywhere in the universe, then we will end up with a universe with fewer and smaller galaxy clusters. So we can, we like to study this effect in our universe. So what we do is we look at a large area in the sky and we look for the galaxy clusters and we measure their mass. We then make a histogram of their mass. So basically the number counts as a function of mass. In a universe with more dark energy, galaxy clusters will have more difficulty to gain their mass. And then we end up with fewer clusters and also smaller 
um, with lower mass. So the number as a function of mass of galaxy clusters in, can help us understand dark energy. So to do this kind of experiment, we use big telescopes to take pictures of large area in the sky. And one of this, and we call this sky surveys or astronomical surveys. And one of the experiments that many of us in Ohio State are involved is the dark energy survey and using this Blanco telescope, which is also in Chile. And another experiment that many of us in Ohio State are working on and very excited about is a new space telescope called WFIRST, which stands for Wide Field Infrared Survey Telescope which will be launched in five years. So to demonstrate how great this new space telescope is, so we have probably familiar with the picture taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. And uh, so here is the size of, example of the size of the picture taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. So one picture of WFIRST will be 200 times um, the size of the picture taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. So this is like we have 200 Hubble Space Telescope in the sky at the same time. And here is JWST, which is also have a smaller area. So here is a picture of the many of the OSU's dark energy experiment team and uh, working on dark energy survey and WFIRST and several other experiments. And I'd like to mention that Su CNT will uh, be talking in a few minutes, telling you more about another experiment that we are all ex very excited about, the dark energy spectroscopic instrument. So my research area, it focused on gravitational lensing by galaxy clusters. We know gravity bends light. And here is a galaxy cluster and its gravity distorts space time and make the path of a light bend. So here is a far away galaxy and it's emitting light in all directions. And the path of a light will be bent by the, gra by the gravitational potential of this galaxy cluster. And when the light of this galaxy reaches the Earth, we will see a distorted image. So here is a picture taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. Again, the galaxy, the so again, the galaxy clusters looks like this uh, orange blobs, and each blob is a galaxy. And among these orange blobs, you can see that there are these giant arcs like part of a circle. And these are basically distorted image of far away galaxies. And here is a zoom in picture of this distorted far away galaxies. It basically look like a large part of a circle and it's, and it's, the, it's the image, it's a light from far away galaxies distorted by the gravity of the galaxy cluster. And using this effect, we can measure the mass of a galaxy cluster. As I mentioned that the galaxy cluster is dominated by dark matter. We cannot see the mass directly. We need to infer the mass using something like gravitational lensing. So let's assume that almost all galaxies in the universe are circles. So if we have a galaxy cluster in front of, in front, then the background galaxy's shape will be um, distorted and we will have some ellipticity. And then we can measure the distortion or the ellipticity of this galaxy, of these galaxies and then plot it as a function of distance to cluster center. If a cluster is more massive, then we expect to see stronger distortion. So we can use this effect to measure the mass, the dark matter, the mass, the total mass of galaxy cluster. 
And how do we get from there to dark energy? As I mentioned that the clustered counts as a function of cluster mass is sensitive to how much dark energy there is in the universe. So for a given dark energy model, we can use theory or simulation, we can predict what the number of clusters versus the number uh, versus its their mass. And then to count, we can use compare this theory prediction to observation and determine the detailed properties of dark energy. And or in other words, we can extract dark energy information from the number of clusters as a function of mass. To summarize, at the beginning, I talk about the evidence that the universe is dominated by dark energy and dark matter. But there are still so many questions we have about dark energy and dark matter. And we use big telescopes surveying large area in the sky to understand them. And one of them is this uh, new uh, space telescope by NASA called WFIRST, which is 200 times more powerful than the Hubble Space Telescope. And my research focused on galaxy clusters and their gravitational lensing effect. And the number of clusters as a function of mass can help us constrain the properties of dark energy and answering the questions of cosmic acceleration and the nature of gravity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Heidi. Uh, we do have one question already for you. Um, Kevin asks if you could talk in a little bit more detail about why slash how the galaxies are not expanding if the rest of the universe is expanding. Yes. So as I mentioned, it's actually similar to this picture. So as I mentioned that it's, it's always a tug of war between dark matter and dark energy. So when dark matter wins, the things are contracting or the things are pulled together. If dark energy wins, then the thing is expanding. So in the galaxy scale, since in the galaxy scale, dark energy is negligible. Dark matter, because the matter is so concentrated in Milky Way compared with the other, the other empty space in the universe, because dark matter and ordinary matter are so concentrated, dark energy is negligible. So the gravity for dark matter and ordinary matter dominates. That's why it's not, that's why the galaxies themselves are not expanding and galaxy clusters themselves are not expanding either. Great, thank you. Uh, we also have a hand raised by Haley. So Haley, can you go ahead and ask your question now? Um, you know, you did an amazing job at describing the images. So thank you so much for that. Okay, thank you. I try to improvise a little because I realized that, yeah, not, thank you. yeah. Not well, everybody. thank you so much. Thank you, Haley. And, and, and thank you, Heidi. Uh, I don't have any other questions for you at the moment. So we're gonna go ahead and move on to our last talk. If we have time at the end, we will go over any pending questions that you guys have for any of this morning's speakers. Uh, but with that, I'd like to turn things over to one of our PhD candidates, Suk Sian T, for our final talk of the morning. All right, um, I'm gonna try and share my screen. Can you see my screen now? Can yes. you hear me? Yep. Okay. So um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me. My name is Suk Sian Ti. I'm a graduate student at the astronomy department here at Ohio State. Um, you've just heard Hi uh, Jai talk about the interstellar medium, and you've just heard Heidi talk about clusters of galaxies. Now we're going to explore something even larger. Um, this pretty background that I have here is an image of the entire night sky. Every bright point is a nearby galaxy, and together these galaxies form very large structures that span the entire sky. We're going to talk about the ensemble of all these large structures that which form the backbone of the universe. We call this the cosmic web, and the cosmic web holds vital clues to how structures first existed in our universe. It is fascinating to think about how the universe went from completely nothing to everything that we now see, 
We believe that the origin of structure came from tiny ripples in the Rayleigh universe, which gave rise to this random afterglow pattern that is visible all over the night sky. However, unfortunately, you can't actually see this with your naked eye. But if you have a powerful radio telescope or a super power radio vision, you see exactly this. This afterglow is called the cosmic microwave background, or CMB for short, and it is the remnant light that is left over by the very early universe. In fact, it is the oldest light that we can see. Um, you'll notice that the CMB is not smooth, it's actually quite clumpy, it's filled with random bright and dark spots. And the bright spots are actually where there are more stuff in the early universe. And with time, these areas with more stuff give rise to galaxies, our Milky Way, and later Earth and Neo fellow Fossa's eagers. In a way, the CMB is the genetic fingerprint of the universe. But how exactly do structures, the galaxies and the clusters of gal galaxies first arise from these random fluctuations in space? Back in the days, there was a structure formation controversy. People were in two camps, arguing about two completely different channels to form structures as we know it. Um, first, much like how a boulder gets broken down into pebbles, and pebbles get later worn down to become sand, the first channel is to go from big things to small things. And in this scenario, large clumps of matter that are super galactic and even super cluster in size form first. These uh, large structures were thought to be thin, like sheets or pancakes. And in honor of Yakov Zeldovich, um, the Russian scientist who first thought of this idea, they were called Zeldovich pancakes. And with time, these pancakes would fragment down into smaller galaxy-sized clumps. The second structure formation channel goes in a completely opposite direction. Here you first have snowflakes, which cluster together to form snow on their way down. And then we have snowballs and finally a snowman. And in this scenario, which is first attributed to James Peebles, small clumps of matter existed first, and then these small clumps attract their surrounding clumps to gravitational attraction, and then they merge to form galaxies and clusters of galaxies. So between these two ways to form structures, which one actually describes our universe? The solution to the puzzle comes from cold dark matter. Um, our new universe is made of three components, normal matter, dark matter, and dark energy. All good things in life, to me at least, involve chocolate. So if our universe is a chocolate cupcake, and shout out to Professor Anika Peter for letting me use her photo, the dark energy would be the cake part of the cupcake. They make up most of the universe, as you heard Heidi uh, mention previously. And dark matter, there would be the chocolate frosting, much less compared to dark energy. And us, the stars and the planets, um, we would be in the sprinkles on top of the cupcake. Not a lot compared to the chocolate frosting and certainly nothing compared to the cake. By dark energy, we don't exactly know what dark matter is. It does not give out light and it interacts only by a gravitational interaction. And we refer to this dark matter as cold because they happen to move quite slowly relative to the speed of light. So cold dark matter, they are clunky and they don't move very fast. And in this universe with cold dark matter, small structures happen to exist first. They then cluster to gravity to form bigger and bigger structures. Um, I've shamelessly plagiarized this video from Heidi's talk, which again shows the formation of a dark matter halo of a cluster of galaxies. Um, note that every point of light is the invisible dark matter, which we cannot see in reality. But since this is a simulation, we can do whatever we want. So notice how we first started out with small individual clumps, and these clumps are actually the size of small dwarfy galaxies. They merge into larger and denser clumps, to become something like the size of a normal galaxy, such as our own Milky Way. And finally, these intermediate clumps also merge to form one giant massive clump of dark matter. And this is roughly the size of a galaxy cluster. And so this way to form structures where small things merge into bigger things results in a wispy and web-like network in the distribution of dark matter with interconnecting filaments, knots, as well as voids of empty space. Now, normal matter, they trace dark matter to gravity. And so where there is more dark matter, there is also an abundance of galaxies. Where there is no dark matter, we also don't see galaxies forming. The CFA survey, uh, it, it took an imagist of where the galaxies are located in the sky. And this is what they saw. 
every dot that you see here represents a galaxy. You can see how the galaxies are not uniformly positioned at all. Instead, they're distributed in a filamentary network with concentrated knots here and there interspersed with empty voids. Especially obvious is this uh, superclusters of galaxies that is affectionately known as the stick man. The interconnecting web lag distribution of galaxies is even more striking in this image of the sky by the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And here again, every colored dot represents a galaxy. However, this is not the entire story. This is not even half of the story. It's because only a quarter of the normal matter in the universe, so the stuff that we and everything we see around us that are made out of, only a quarter of the normal matter actually reside in stars and galaxies. A large fraction of the normal matter are actually found in the non-luminous matter, the things that don't actually give out much light. These are the low density gases that permeate the spaces between galaxies. And this is uh, one of my field of uh, research. This pretty picture here is a simulation of our universe. It shows where all the normal matter are. You can ignore the blue colors for now, but the green color represents these low density gases and the yellow dots. You might need to scream a bit harder to make them out, but these yellow dots, there are the galaxies that are sprinkled or strung along this web of intergalactic gases. Immediately, you can already see that there's more green than there is yellow, indicating that most of the normal matter are found in these gases. These gases also trace out where the dark matter is through gravity. And so in a way, this snapshot is also a snapshot of where the dark matter are located in our universe. As you know by now, this web-like pattern of structures all over the sky is what astronomers call the cosmic web. Galaxies form at the intersecting knots, and gases will flow along this filamentary highway to fuel star formation in these galaxies. This intergalactic gas that pervades the spaces between galaxies is called the intergalactic medium, or IGM. Don't be fooled by the benign connotation when we refer to them as gases that are not like the typical gases that we encounter here on Earth. First of all, they are mostly hydrogen and helium, the two most abundant elements in the universe. The IGM is also very tenuous and rarefied. So compared to galaxies or the interstellar medium that has a million atoms per cubic meter, there's only one lonely atom per cubic meter in the IGM. So to bring this picture to home, um, in this social distancing era, we're called to stand six feet apart, one meter is roughly three feet. And so this means in a space between you and your neighbor, who is standing six feet away, there are only two tiny weeny hydrogen atoms and nothing else. Um, the IGM gases are also very hot. They're at least twice hotter, if not many thousands of times hotter than our sun. I don't know about you, but the IGM doesn't sound like a very fun place to be. However, I'm very interested in studying these gases because they tell us a lot about the universe. But first, how do we even see these gases? I mentioned that they don't give out light, unlike galaxies. So astronomers solve this by using bad lights instead. We use very bright galaxies as bad lights, and when the galaxy light passes through these gases, they get absorbed. So when we point our telescope towards the bright galaxy and take a one-dimensional spectrum, a spectrum is when we split the light into its constituent wavelengths of color components. We see this. This is a cartoon of a spectrum. It shows the intensity of light, also known as flux, over the wavelength of light. At the position of the galaxy, we would see excess light because the galaxy is bright. And on their way to us, this galaxy light gets absorbed by the intervening gas, and astronomers look out for these dips in the spectrum, indicating where there is less gas, less light. And so these dips tell us the location of these gases which is how we quote unquote see these gases. Now I replaced the cartoon with an actual spectrum. As before, this spike here indicates the location of the bright galaxy that we're using as our backlight. And then there's this forest of dips and absorptions that um, arise when the galaxy light is absorbed by the intervening IGM. This forest of absorption looks random and noisy at first glance, but their box statistical properties Contain clues about various properties of the universe. I spent a lot of time working with the spectra of the gases using actual data and simulation. And one of the things that I'm interested in is to study how clustered these gases are. And so what we do is that we take every point in this spectra 
and we look at how much gases there are at a certain distance away, say right here. And then we do this for a range of different distances. Even though the gases look unorganized and random, it appears that they are on average separated by a fixed distance away from each other. This uh, plot here is what I used to study how clustered the gases are. It's called the correlation function. It shows how correlated the gases are as a function of separation. So notice the bump right here. What this bump says is that you're more likely to find the IGM gases separated at, uh, by this particular distance than at any other distances that are either closer or further away. And so the clustering of these gases help us to answer questions like how structures form, how fast the universe is expanding, and even tells us what is the nature of dark energy and dark matter. And so to me, that's uh, pretty exciting. So no astronomy talk is complete without showing pictures of telescopes. One of the telescopes that, uh, that I and many astronomers use to take spectra of these gases is DESI, the Dark Energy Spectroscopic Instrument. It is a facility uh, located at the Mayo Telescope at Cape Peak Observatory in Tucson, Arizona. It will start taking data this summer, and once it turns on, it will image a very large portion of the night sky and produce the largest 3D map of the large-scale structures in our universe. This picture here shows the Mayo telescope. I spent a lot of time um, at the Mayo. The blue part here is the um, telescope supporting structure. The primary, the primary mirror of the telescope is located at the bottom here, and it focuses light into the DESI instrument, which sits on top of the telescope right here. So one of the enabling technologies that allows DESI to produce this large map of the universe are these tiny robots. Each of these robots is connected to a fiber optics cable, which is used to collect light from galaxies. Back in the days, we used to rely on humans to manually position these fiber cables on plot plates. What happened is that you have this circular plate that has been punched with holes at the locations of the galaxies. And every night you have a human manually plugging fiber optics onto the holes of these plates. As you can imagine, this is a slow and pretty tedious process. And so uh, with modern technology, we've done away with human positioners and plot plates and replaced them with robots, which makes the data taking so much faster. So DAISY uses our robotic positioners to place fiber optics on galaxies. And these robots will swivel around to the locations that we instruct them to. DAISY has 10 of these pie shaped slides. Um, together, they allow us to image the spectra of 5,000 galaxies at once. After we're done collecting light from uh, one set of galaxies, we will point the telescope elsewhere and the robots will swivel to the next set of galaxies. We will repeat this procedure night after night for the next five years, slowly building, building up a map of where all the galaxies and where all the gases are in the universe. DESI plans to image 35 million galaxies throughout its five year lifetime, which is the most that any telescope has ever done uh, so far. And some of the galaxies will be used as the bed lights for the intergalactic medium. And together, the gases um, in the galaxies, they form the large scale structures that trace out the cosmic web, allowing us to uh, study structure formation, dark matter, dark energy, and the evolution of the cosmos. Next five years will be pretty exciting. So do keep an eye out and see what Desi can tell us about the universe. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so we do have a little bit of time for questions now. So we're going to go ahead and go over some of the questions that I currently have open in our chat. Uh, as a reminder, our next event is at noon. Uh, and so we have a little bit of time here to answer some of the things you all are wondering. Uh, so one, we have a question on neutrinos uh, for John Beacom. So John, if you're available uh, for everyone interested, the question uh, being asked, uh, Oh, and he actually answered it via text, but I'm going to read it for folks because I think this is interesting for everyone. So how do we use neutrinos to determine information about where the neutrino came from? And this person is wondering, can you use that light to tell us something about the center of the sun? Uh, so John, uh, would you like to read out your answer? Would you like for me to read off what you've typed? In this oh, topic? it's okay. I just, I'm mostly done typing them. Oh, cool. Great. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, skip over that one then, since you answered it for him. 
uh, and go to some of the more open ones. Uh, so we have one here uh, for Jai uh, from Heather, who wants to know, was our son born in an interstellar nursery? Do new stars leave the nursery and form solar systems? Right, awesome question. So um, based on our current knowledge uh, of those stellar nurseries, uh, at least for our Milky Way, almost all the stars were formed in their own stellar nurseries. So that's the short question, uh, that's the short answer. And also when the stars are, when the stars were born, uh, they were born together with their planetary system around them. So that's why the, uh, the stellar nurseries are important because they are directly related to the origin of all the suns and solar systems around us. And like in, in any given galaxy. And as a follow up, another attendee asks, to you, uh, do these stellar nurseries move over time or do they remain most, mostly stationary? All right, uh, that's a great question. So uh, again, if you, <laughs> I, I don't have the picture right now, but if you imagine a spiral galaxy in your mind, uh, we know that spiral galaxy, those spiral patterns actually rotate around the center of the galaxy with time. And uh, because all those, star, uh, the, those stellar nurseries uh, suffer from the same gravitational pull from the galaxy, they will more or less do it in the same way. So they will also rotate uh, around, uh, around the center of the galaxy together with all the other materials and stars uh, in the galaxy, although they might uh, be in a slightly different orbit uh, depending on the details of physics there. Great, uh, and you're just a popular person for questions today. We have another stellar nursery one for you, Jai, uh, <laughs> from Robert who asks, how do the lifetimes of these stellar nurseries located in the periphery of a galaxy compared to those of stellar nurseries nearer to the center? All right, uh, that's, a, that's a very good question. So I think to answer, that question, to answer that question, we actually need to pull out a very recent paper that uh, our collaboration uh, have written like just this year, published this year. Uh, and I think the short answer is that based on the observation, um, based on the observation of the first 10 galaxies in our sample, we do not see a clear trend of the lifetime of the stellar nurseries as a function of their location. So we do not see that the stellar nurseries locating in the center of a galaxy to be very different uh, compared to the lifetime of a stellar nursery locating in the outer edge uh, of a galaxy. Great, thank you. Uh, another one for you. Uh, can you explain the negative feedback loop of stellar nurseries and young stars? What is causing the supernova that destroys the nursery? Yes, um, so the negative feedback loop is like this. So we have stellar nurseries. Uh, stellar nurseries are able to give birth to young stars. Um, when they give birth to young stars, um, they give birth usually to, typically to a population of young stars. Some of them are more massive, some of them are less massive. Uh, depending on the mass of the individual stars, they will uh, pour uh, a ton of photons and radiation into the gas and uh, interstellar medium around them. So um, that radiation tends to heat up the gas and that will uh, make the stellar nursery less capable of producing more stars because that's making the gas hotter and less dense. Um, and regarding the supernova question, uh, uh, and, and I just uh, want to mention briefly that uh, when you have a mass enough star and the star, uh, when we have a mass enough star, those massive stars usually have shorter times, shorter lifetimes compared to less massive stars. And uh, when those massive stars die, they will die in a very spectacular way by creating a huge bomb, uh, a huge explosion in the universe, which is called supernova. And uh, that huge explosion will um, basically, um, that huge explosion will uh, pour a huge amount of energy in all different kinds of forms into the interstellar medium. And that's especially destructive because that can basically heat up the gas to very high temperature and pulls all the gas away and change all the phases in the gas to a very high temperature, maybe even highly ionized phase. And that's uh, deadly for the star forming regions. So, so that can really stop uh, the star forming activity in a, a, a huge chunk of the galaxy. So I think that's, yeah. Great, uh, and then two questions from someone named Barbara who wants to confirm stellar nurseries are much more dense than a vacuum, correct? Uh, well, <laughs> let, let's put it, pick this apart. So when we are talking about a vacuum, 
um, there's no absolute vacuum in the universe. Uh, when we are talking about a vacuum, we are talking about a region that's much less dense compared to what we um, usually, what, what we are familiar with around us. For example, they are compared to the density of the air uh, on Earth. What I was referring to uh, when, I comparing, when I was comparing stellar nurseries or when I was comparing interstellar medium in general to vacuum chambers was that if you look at the average density in the inter interstellar medium, uh, most, of the, most of the volume in the interstellar space are filled with gas that are at a density of about one particle per cubic centimeter. Um, but if you compare that to the vacuum chambers that we create on Earth, the best industrial level vacuum chambers on Earth has a density of at most 10 to the four, uh, or that's 10,000 particles per cubic centimeter. So actually, we aren't able to create as good a vacuum chamber as the average interstellar medium. So that's what I was uh, trying to say. Thank you. And as a follow-up for that, she also asks, uh, did you say that the interstellar medium is 15% of all ordinary matter? Oh, uh, sorry for the confusion. I was referring to, I, I was saying that the interstellar medium accounts for 15% of all the ordinary matter in the galaxy. I see. Like our Milky Way. So this is really depend this is really depending on the location. Uh, if we are actually talking about the gas in the intergalactic medium, as Saxin just mentioned, uh, that's much lower density, but that contains much more mass if we are talking about the whole the, the, the mass budget of the whole universe. But if we are focusing on a mass budget in the galaxy, a typical galaxy like Milky Way is about like 10 to 15 percent in the interstellar medium. Great, thank you. And one more question for you, then we'll let you out of the hot seat. Uh, Paul asks, can you comment on the current thinking about the distribution of stellar masses within star forming regions? At one time, this was a puzzle. Oh, uh, I just want to make sure I understand this question correctly. Uh, sorry, I was, uh, I, my understanding is that the question is asking about um, how many stars how many massive stars versus how many less massive stars are formed in each individual stellar nurseries? I think if that's the question uh, is being asked, then the answer is um, um, we sort of right now we sort of know uh, how the uh, how the distribution of stellar mass in the stellar nursery is about, and uh, we sort of find some clue uh, about. Uh, that distribution of stellar mass, of newly created stellar mass, uh, being related to the distribution of the masses of the most densest cores in those uh, stellar nurseries. So actually, if we're talking about stellar nurseries, that's actually quite a lot of different structures. And some of them are dense, some of them are less dense. And stars only form in the densest cores. And actually, the, dense, the, the, the distribution of the mass of those cores sort of uh, has a one-to-one -one correspondence to the distribution of the stellar mass. I think, yeah, hopefully that answers the question. Thank you so much. Um, Haley, I see your hand is raised. I'm not sure if this is from last time or if you have a new question, but I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. Oh, um, um, oh dear. Do you have a question, Haley, or no? I do not. Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. I'm going to go ahead and put the hand icon down. And then we have two questions left, and I think just enough time to do them. And these are both for Sukien. Uh, the first question is, why are the IGM gases so hot and where does this energy come from? It's a very good question. And astronomers have struggled with this in the past, but we think that, so initially, so these gases over the history of the universe, they go through various phases and evolutions. Initially, it's very cold, but then as the universe starts to uh, produce galaxies and stars, and these galaxies and stars are very hot, and so they inject energy into the intergalactic medium. And so they, it, the energy from the stars, the supernova, the ga uh, galaxies and the stars, they would pump up the temperature of these gases from very cold to very hot that we see right now. Great, thank you. And one more question for you uh, coming from Michael who asks, how do you differentiate when looking at the spectrograph collected from a light source separated by the IgM between different gas clouds? Uh, so the first question again is, how are you differentiating when looking at the spectrograph collected from a light source that's separated by the IGM between different gas clouds? And then additionally, 
do the gas clouds largely have the same composition? Or uh, so, for example, do they have the same absorption lines in the spectrograph? All right, that's that's a very good detailed question. So um, first of all, you can think of these gas clouds as the, in, the intergalactic medium. It's They're almost the same thing. So gas clouds equal um, IgM. So there's no differentiating to do. But then there's another layer to this. So there's, although I say the IgM is the same as the gas clouds, but there's different types of uh, gases in the universe. So the IgM is very low uh, in density, but there's also uh, gases in the, uh, in the associated galaxies. So when our sideline passes through sort of the age of a galaxy, and these gases in this galaxy, they have different properties. They are more dense. And so when we take spectra of a line of sight that passes through the ages of galaxies, then we will see a stronger absorption than we will see from uh, absorptions from the intergalactic medium. Excellent. And I think that is all the questions we have time for today. So we want to give you all a couple minutes to uh, get over to our, our lunch, ses lunch sessions. Um, so I want to thank all of our speakers for their wonderful talks this morning. And thank you all for joining us. Uh, as a reminder, I just dropped all the lunch links in the chat. Uh, so again, you're more than welcome to move in and out of these rooms, to eat lunch during the meetings. We will have video and sound. So unlike this one, where it's structured where just our panelists have video, this is more informal, more of a virtual face-to-face. -face. So you will have video and audio capabilities in whichever lunch rooms you go to. And then we hope you join us back here at this same link you used this morning for the one o'clock black hole apocalypse panel. Uh, and again, it's just this link you joined uh, from the morning. So use that same link to come back. And we hope to see you all in our lunches and to join us back here to learn about Black Hole Apocalypse. Thank you all so much. I hope you enjoy your lunch with an astronomer. I'm sorry we can't do it in person this year, but I'm looking forward to the conversations that take place. And I'll see you all back here very soon. Thank you.